We come now to the last speaker of our afternoon session, the first plenary session, who is Sir Mark Walport, who was appointed government chief scientific advisor and head of uh, the government office for science in April 2013. And in this position, he's also co-chairing the Prime Minister's Council for Science and Technology. And his previous career highlights include Inter Alia, director of the Wellcome Trust, I think for quite some period of time, and also a professor of medicine and head of the division of medicine at Imperial College in London. So Mark Walpott will speak about scientific support for, for effective policy development, putting it into practice. So Mark Walpott, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much indeed, and it's an honour and a privilege to speak this afternoon. Uh, there are some disadvantages to going last, and the main one is that some of you might wish you were somewhere else at this stage of a very long afternoon, and indeed, some already are. Um, <laughs> although I have to say uh, that it's still a pretty full audience, so congratulations to everyone for hanging in there. Uh, but there is a big advantage of going last, and that is that you can actually respond to some of the things that were said earlier. Um, one of the things I want to start with is to say that actually our food is extraordinarily safe. We live much longer than previous generations. We live much healthier lives. And arguably, of course, the greatest advance in public health was separating the water we excrete from the water we drink. So we do need to actually look at all of this in the context that we are living in a very, very safe world. And of course, the paradox, although maybe it isn't, is that the safer we become, the more risk averse we become. But I want to start on the topic of framing, because I think that we all agree that framing matters. But I then want to pick up Sheila Jasonoff, because you used two words to frame your introduction, and you talked about pure science and impure science, and you did that deliberately, I think, because, of course, purity, these are highly value-laden words. Purity, pure is good, impure is bad. People market water on the basis of its purity. Um, but, of course, the reality is that, actually, the substances we eat and the fluids we drink are all impure. It is actually that chromium-3 that we actually need. It's the impurities. And, in fact, life on Earth depends on the fact that we consume these very impure mixtures because we need trace elements. And, of course, trace and impurity start to coincide with each other. Um, and Andy Stelling said that sort of knowledge is democratic. But now let me reframe pure and impure science for you. Um, and this is something, actually, that my PhD supervisor did many years ago. And he distinguished, Sir Peter Lackman, between what he called polable questions and non-polable questions. And what he meant by that was polable questions are questions that you can vote on the answer. But the natural sciences deal to a very large extent with non-polable questions, questions actually that you can't vote on. There is actually a right answer. Uh, what Daniel Moynihan, the American politician, famously said, you can have your own opinions, but you can't have your own facts. It is not a polable question, for example, as to what the triplet code in DNA is in terms of encoding amino acids. You can have any opinion you like about that, but there is actually a set of right answers. Um, it is not a polable question, sorry, it's, it's not a polable question as to whether the Earth is roughly spherical. You know, actually you can walk on the edge as long as you like, you won't fall off. Um, <laughs> But, of course, there are also many questions that are polable where you can actually vote on the answer. And actually, much of the social sciences is in the realms of polable questions where there isn't a right answer, or where democratic decisions do get made. Um, and if you like, the central thesis of my presentation to you this afternoon is that I think that we need to do much better in terms of making judgments on the basis of much sounder discussions. We need to be much less sloppy in our use of words. Um, and I think that we must stop conflating questions about non-polable issues of science with discussions about values. 
Um, and finally, I'm going to say something about uh, having specific discussions about technologies, not generic discussions about technologies. You know, it is a ridiculous question to ask, is nanotechnology a good thing or a bad thing? It entirely depends on what nano substance, with what particular application, under what particular circumstances. And yet we have discussions about technologies as though they are all or nothing things. And then finally, I'm going to say something about regulation. Um, but at the end of the day, decisions do have to be made. So let me start by just telling you a little bit about what being a government chief scientific advisor is about, because I think it will help to frame the rest of my remarks. Um, and um, I'm, a, I'm a, a bird watcher as a hobby. Um, I'm not actually a twitcher, but a, in the league of sort of rarity of scientists, then chief scientific advisors are the sorts of things that twitchers go out to observe because we're so rare. Um, so what's the job of the UK government's chief scientific advisor? Um, it's very straightforward. It's to advise uh, the Prime Minister and the government on all aspects of science, engineering, technology, and social science for all of government policy. Uh, it's very narrowly defined. <laughs> um, okay, so how does one make sense of that very broad description? So the first thing to say is that the Germans have a word for all the sciences, is Wissenschaft, and I think we do have to apply all of the sciences in advising government. The second thing is you have to worry about what is it that government cares about. And government broadly cares about two things. It cares about us, the citizens, and it cares about our health, our well-being, our resilience, and our security. And the second thing that government cares about is the economy. Um, because actually without a decent economy, it's quite hard to have health, well-being, resilience, and security. And of course, in democratic societies, governments also care about being re-elected. Uh, but that's not science. Um, so those needs and desires of government really frame the work of a scientific advisor, and be it an individual or, in fact, a committee of people that are advising government. What does our health, well-being, resilience, and security depend on? It depends on something that we take for granted until it goes wrong. It depends on our infrastructure. And you can divide our infrastructure into our built, engineered, increasingly our technological infrastructure, um, it then depends on our natural infrastructure, and that's human, animal, and plant health, and then the geophysical environment, uh, climate, weather, uh, earthquakes, volcanoes, depending on where you are in the world. Um, and then it depends on third infrastructure, which is our social infrastructure. And so my job is to act as a transmission mechanism, and of course my friends look at me and they say, you went to medical school, what on earth are you doing advising the government on weather and climate? Um, but the answer is, of course, that my job is to act as a transmission mechanism. It is to find the best scientific advice wherever it is and communicate that to government. And so a lot of my job is actually about clear communication. On knowledge translated to economic advantage, that is actually about bringing together our excellent science, engineering, technology, and social science in academia linking it with industry so that government can make the right policies uh, for innovation to thrive. And here again, I must sort of respectfully disagree with Andy Sterling, which is that innovation solves problems. It isn't something that's sort of abstract. And as I will show you in the moment, we face some huge problems, seven billion people rising to approximately nine billion by 2050 raises some enormous challenges for which we need innovation if we're going to be able to solve them. There's also a role of the right science in emergencies, so providing scientific advice when something does go wrong, either in the UK or abroad where UK citizens are involved. And it is, wherever possible, to underpin policy with evidence. Um, and it's a base question of um, policy based on evidence rather than evidence based on policy. Um, but one of the things you learn very quickly when you are a scientific advisor is that there's a distinction between providing advice and making policy. And the policymaker, who ultimately are politicians in democratically elected societies, um, and actually indeed in non-democratically uh, societies, it is actually the politicians ultimately that decide, they look through three different lenses. The first lens they look through is they hopefully will look through the lens of evidence. What do we know about X or Y? 
The second lens they look through is the lens of, if I make a policy, is it deliverable? So you can have the best policy on the planet, but if it can't be delivered, then it isn't a good policy. And the third lens they look through is that political lens, that value lens of that particular tribe of politics who has been a uh, politician who's been elected, what will my electorate think? All the sum of different values. And values come in, as Perry said, lots of different domains. Um, and then finally, there is a role for advocacy for science and evidence in government. So it is innovation that's got us where we are now. We can only live as 7 billion people on the planet because we've learned to adapt our environment so that human beings can live uh, so well. Uh, but that has brought its own problems. So we're dependent on widespread electrification. Um, power goes out in here. Paralysis. We're all scrabbling to find our way out. Uh, improvements in healthcare, the ability to mass produce things, logistics, transport links, the ability to move food and other goods around. Um, and of course, that enormous explosion in the population is well recognized. And innovation really is needed where we're going. Um, so we have the challenge of population growth and indeed of population aging, so changing demographics around the world. Uh, we have the consequences of are burning all of our ancestors in the form of fossil fuel and releasing all that carbon dioxide that they'd fixed back into the atmosphere, increasing the blanket covering the planet and causing warming. Uh, there's all of the challenges of water scarcity um, and the threat of food security. And then there's the challenge of um, uh, our um, waste, um, our consumption of more than we need and the development of obesity. Um, and we, interestingly, I see the logo of which there, and uh, is that we recently did some public engagement um, with uh, a series of focus groups in partnership between the Government Office of Science and which, just to understand what people knew about food and how they thought about it once they'd been given some more information about food production. Uh, because most people, I think, sort of slightly think that food grows in shops. Um, and it's one of the big challenges that we've become very disconnected from our sources of uh, nutrition and water. And so there are lots of technological solutions. And uh, Andy rightly said that plant biotechnology includes a lot more than GMOs. It includes all sorts of genetic modifications. Uh, there's all the role of animal biotechnology, the potential for precision agriculture, the potential to grow our food in the laboratory rather than the shop. Um, and uh, species such as insects or, uh, 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 as food. And so there are some very interesting opportunities. Um, and of course, we tend, whether it be energy or food, to talk about the production side uh, rather more than we talk about the consumption side. And of course, the challenge to us is how do we, um, and it's easy to talk about changing behavior, but we know, and I know from being a medical practitioner, how difficult it is to change behavior. Um, but we know that the resources consumed in producing a pound of meat are dramatically different in all aspects from water uh, through to everything else compared with a pound of uh, soybean, for example. Um, and, of course, the other thing that we could do, which would be very good for all of us, would be to reduce food waste through improving packaging, through having much smaller portion sizes. Um, that would be good for us. Uh, how do we get the incentives to the industry to actually help with this? Now, because risk is all pervasive in my work as a government chief scientist, um, last year, um, with help from an expert group, including Andy sitting here, um, we produced a report entitled Innovation, Managing Risk, Not Avoiding It. And I think that that's something that's very important, which is that risk is not. A risk register tells you what you need to think about. But the whole point of a risk register is that it enables you to manage risk. You don't always just simply walk away from risk. Um, and as I've said, innovation is all too often held back by poorly framed discussions. And of course, if you don't do something, there are the consequences of not doing it, as well as the consequences that might have happened if you had done it. So you have to think about both. Now here, I think the panel probably agree entirely that food is inherently cultural, and it is an area where science does meet values. So I'm not going to belabor this point because Nigel Walker has already brought it up, but there is a major challenge in the confusion of terminology between hazard and risk. And I don't need 
I think, to belabor this in this audience because you know about this. But I think this is quite a good illustration, which is the hazard in this picture is very clear. It's the sharp teeth and the jaw muscles of the conga eel. Um, the question is, what's the risk to the fish sitting in the jaws of the mouth? Um, there's no doubt that the fish here is exposed. It's sitting in exactly the wrong place. Uh, but, of course, the thing that didn't come out in um, uh, Nigel's slide was the issue of vulnerability. Because, actually, of course, this fish is not vulnerable. It's a cleaner ras. It's the dental hygienist of the moray eel. It cleans its teeth. It gets a meal in the process. And as a reward for having its teeth cleaned, the moray eel doesn't uh, consume the cleaner ras. And, of course, it makes the point that risk is actually the product of hazard, exposure, and vulnerability which, of course, differs according to age, for example. And the whole point about uncertainty is that the first time we see this, we may be a bit uncertain about the outcome for that fish. Um, and science, of course, is about reducing uncertainty through observation and through experiment as appropriate. So, going fairly rapidly through the different areas where science meets values, um, the first is the question of um, areas where there is a high level of acceptance. Um, and in fact, decoding how a cow walking through a supermarket actually illustrates this is a subject for all our imagination, I think. Um, drugs is a very good example, where by and large, we accept medicines as being a public good. But the question, the value question is, who pays? So are they distributed fairly? In the case of an Ebola epidemic in West Africa, why didn't we have a vaccine? Well, two reasons, really, because A, there are an awful lot of diseases out there that are absolutely ghastly viruses, so which ones do we choose to make vaccines to? But more importantly, I think, what was the market going to be for an Ebola vaccine? And so that sort of issue as to who pays, issues of equity and fairness, come up with innovation all the time. I'll get the innovation, you won't, as it were, or you'll get the innovation, I won't. Um, but the second area, I think, is where um, science really crashes into religious, cultural, ethical values. And uh, laboratory-grown meat has a sort of yuck factor, um, so that's a sort of a value system. But I, I want to focus for a second on uh, GMOs, because this is where we really do f conflate discussions about science with discussions about values. It is a completely ridiculous question to ask whether GMOs are a good thing or a bad thing. It is always what gene, what organism, and for what purpose. And this applies generally with technology. We fall into a trap when we talk about technologies in a generic way. It's the specific application. And where I think we conflate the discussion is that there are some people who believe and we live in plural societies where you have people with different beliefs, that it is wrong for human beings to fiddle with nature. That it's something that, you know, for religious beliefs or whatever, is wrong. And instead of saying, that's what I think, there tends to be, there's something wrong with the science. And I think that we need to be much clearer about understanding the science on the one hand, recognizing that there's then a values discussion on the other side, and recognizing that values are plural. And so, again, taking on Andy slightly, we can discuss these things until we go blue in the face. But at the end of the day, we're not going to agree. There will always be people who hold different opinions. And the great thing about democracy is that it resolves those disagreements and a decision is made which is not going to please everyone. And I think one of the problems we have is that we're much too slow in that process and we're not clear enough about it. And I think the other thing that we have to recognize is that not only clearly values differ within societies, they will differ in this audience. We will think different things about things. But they differ between countries. They differ between states in, in federal countries, such as the United States. Um, and at the end of the day, then we have to work out whose values trump whose. Is it a, and that's a sort of fundamental question. It's a question for the European Union. Whose values trump whose? in a Europe where, in one country, people are allergic to a nuclear energy, in another country, people are allergic to um, a genetic modified organisms. And I'm, I'm grossly sort of oversimplifying it, but uh, this is a really important question, I think. Um, the third issue about uh, science and values is where the benefits in one place 
and the risk are in others. And so in food production systems, that's about how land is used. And if land is used for one purpose, then it can't be used for another purpose. And whether it be for solar panels, for intensive farming, uh, indeed for recreational use, for housing, for wind farms, all of these things are potentially contentious because a benefit is felt in one place and a disbenefit in another. And then, of course, finally, we have to recognize that there are unintended consequences. And actually, in food production, one of the biggest series of unintended consequences have been in the way people have moved animals and plants around the world for millennia in a slightly random fashion um, with, from time to time, very severe unintended consequences. So where I think I agree with everyone else is that we do need to hold a wider conversation about risk. Risk is a societal issue. But I think we need to be much clearer in our use of language. We need to understand the different values and lenses that individuals look through. Uh, we need to understand who benefits, who carries the risk. And uh, transparency is, of course, a watchword. But as uh, the great philosopher Nora Neill uh, Nora Neal says, uh, transparency isn't in and of itself a good thing. It's got to be intelligent transparency. Just putting out lots of numbers isn't much value. Data without metadata don't mean very much. The challenge, of course, is transparency is about turning data into information, turning that information into knowledge, and then hopefully applying that knowledge widely. Um, so what is it that science can contribute? What science can contribute, and I think this is an important role for EFSA, is the meta-analysis, actually. So there's a great deal of focus in the academic enterprise on the individual scientific paper. But actually what I'm interested in when I'm advising government is how you distill the totality of that information. Um, and of course, scientific information is contingent. There are some things we know more about than others. And often in an emergency, the knowledge is at best contingent, but it doesn't alter the fact that policymakers do have to make decisions and they have to make it, make it based on the best distillation of the evidence. And so what I need as a scientific advisor is the best meta-analysis. And of course, the world I come from, which is medicine, in some ways invented this through things like Cochrane reviews, which actually take all of the evidence about the use of a medicine in a particular set of conditions and actually distill the best evidence. And I think one of the challenges is that the media in particular tend to view us as scientists in a very generic way. And so a scientist says somehow comes with some kind of imprimatur. But as we all know, there are good scientists and there are bad scientists. Um, and what I really need is actually less promotion of the individual study and more meta-analysis to actually know what the sum of things is. And of course, that's what EFSA is about in terms of summarizing the evidence and providing it to uh, policymakers. It's what Nigel does um, in the US. Um, and so actually, I can turn to my medical school colleagues on climate change and say, Actually, that one's not too difficult because the IPCC provide the meta-analysis of all meta-analyses in terms of the question about um, anthropogenic uh, contribution to climate change, which incidentally is a non-polable question. <laughs> it is not a matter of voting whether human beings through our carbon emissions and other greenhouse gases are changing the climate of the planet. There is a right answer to that question. Um, of course, we go through stages of uncertainty and imprecision but actually, we've gone through many of the stages of uncertainty now, so the IPCC can make some confident statements. Now, I just want to end, really, with some of the regulatory challenges which we talked about in that um, review on um, risk and innovation. And I think that um, these are generic challenges, and they're certainly not directed at any particular regulator. But the first challenge is in systems where we have to have economic regulation in place because the market doesn't work in a normal way. Um, and the challenge for economic regulation is to recognize that whilst it's all about giving us, the consumers, uh, the best value for money, providing that best value for money requires that there is resilience and future-proofing built into the system, whether it be a water supply, a power supply, or anything else. We need resilience. Um, and so you need to take a systems approach when you're thinking about regulation. 
The second is a, is a difficult problem, and I'm, I'm, I, I don't exaggerate it, but it's what I call asymmetric incentives. And that's perhaps most easily articulated in the following way, that if a regulator allows something to happen that causes harm, they get into terrible trouble. If they stop something happening that would have done good, then there aren't really any consequences. Now, it's slightly unfair because it's not as um, binary as that. But nevertheless, the incentive system means that if something goes wrong, there's always someone to blame. And it's usually ultimately the politician or the large corporation. And the regulator sits as part of that loop. Um, and so how do we solve that problem? Well, I think ultimately you can only solve the problem if you make regulators accountable for all of the decisions they make, whether it's to stop something happening or to allow it. The third issue with regulation is that it tends to become encrusted, by which I mean you add more and more stuff in, um, and it's much harder to take it out than it is to put it in. And I think that's a challenge, certainly, that the UK government recognises at the moment and is trying to simplify regulation. And then I think there's the whole challenge of how you regulate in an area where science meets values. And I think a good example of that is the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority in the UK, because, of course, embryo technologies really do get into the land of religious beliefs and values. And what that regulator does is it conducts a public conversation as well as reviewing the science in an area of science which has changed dramatically since the HFEA was formed 20 or 30 years ago. Um, and by having that conversation, uh, the UK got through a whole discussion and debate about the science of the possibility of preventing the transmission of mitochondrial diseases from mother to child uh, by nuclear transplantation techniques. Um, and that ended up in a sort of perfect democratic situation where at the end of the discussion, a free vote was taken in the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Um, but I think we need to find mechanisms for that sort of regulation in that sort of um, environment. Um, so to end, um, I agree with everyone, I think, that widening the conversation is a democratic uh, necessity. Um, and I think that there are ways to do it. But I think the great challenge is that ultimately a decision has to be made. And what I would say in conclusion is that the job of a policymaker is much harder than the job of a scientific advisor. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sir Walbert, for this very inspiring speech. I guess there is a need for discussion. I would like to separate the discussion we have now to focus first on clarification questions, a few, two or three questions we could take from that sort, and then we will have uh, the overall panel discussion with all our speakers. So are there any questions dedicated to the last speech in, in view of finding clarification? Yes. There's one in the back side. Can you stand up, we already have the microphone. Yes, please. Yes, my name is Helen Wallström from SVA in Sweden. Uh, you mentioned that uh, who benefits and who carries the risk. I think this is a problem that we account now and then. Do you have any further comment how you should handle such a case? Um, yes, I mean the most common situation where that happens is actually in the case of large infrastructure projects. So a, um, the location of a big physical facility um, somewhere, um, uh, for, uh, rail is, is a good example of that where a, a high speed rail goes zooming past someone's house but they have to go um, uh, 70 miles or 70 kilometers to find the station. Um, and the answer is that society has to find uh, ways of compensating the people who have disadvantaged. And of course, historically, there are many ways for doing that. Um, but it's a common situation. And basically, there, are, there have to be ways, as it were, for balancing the benefits and the risks. And the uh, compensation is a typical way for doing that. Thank you very much. Are there further questions? 
if not, if I may, I would, I would like to ask you one question. I think we all would agree that we have to, to, to separate value judgments from science, but when we do risk assessment, would you, wouldn't you see that in the risk assessment process, because at the end it's about expert judgment, there are inbuilt values which the scientists often are not even aware of, or could be not aware of. So how can we tackle this problem that the inbuilt beliefs of, because of our education, of the school of thinking, of, of what we experienced in our life, influence the way we judge situations with lack of what we call sound evidence? I, but that, I think, is about the rigor of the science. And actually, where I um, uh, disagreed with Nigel was when you described the work on BPA as impure science. Actually, it's quite the reverse of impure science. What you were doing was providing very rigorous methodology to remove biases, for example, by blinding the samples. Um, and so it's actually about doing the science very well. Um, and that is actually about the value system of science, where um, uh, rigor, skepticism, uh, doing controls pro properly, blinding samples is important. And if you like, part of the meta-analysis of science is actually recognizing when a, a, a study is a good study or not. And so part of the Cochrane review process is actually to rate the quality of the studies and say, you know, that one actually was an, an observational study with three patients and doesn't mean very much, actually. Um, and so I think it's about doing the science very well. Um, but I, that's, that's, I, I still think there is a, a, a fairly clear separation between the sort of the polable and the non-polable. Um, and the regulator's job, I think, is to make clear what the science, sorry, the, 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 the EFSA, for example, is to make clear what the science is. Ultimately, the policymakers do have to make the value decisions in areas which are contested. And it comes back to that word purity, actually, which is conceptions of purity, which are heavily value-based, are very interesting. They differ between countries. Uh, it's extraordinary, this sort of amount of marketing that goes into these sort of false conceptions about purity, where one of the challenges to all of us is, I think, that as our measurement techniques become more and more sophisticated, you can measure you know, half the chemical universe in a glass of water, and does it matter? Well, probably in the case of 99.9999% of it, it doesn't. Thank you very much. Yes, please. I, I got a, I got a question, and it's just related because the decision making at the end is related to national or local or whatever. I mean, if you frame a big question, we have to fetch so billions of, of citizens. But at the end, the UK government will only care about UK citizens and the relation to others. My question is there. It is important in the policy making to actually recognize what are your servicing to, um, your own industry, your own citizens, your own environment. Of course, you are linked to globally, but at the end, your decisions might not be oh, relevant I, uh, for others, you know? The kind uh, no, of, of course, that's perfectly true, but I think it's actually uh, not fair on national politicians to think that they don't recognize that we're all part of global networks. You know, ultimately, the air we breathe is air that we share. The water we drink ultimately is shared. And so I think that uh, it's, it's very common for people to say that politicians think in the short term and they look too locally. I don't actually believe that the evidence supports that. Okay. Maybe the C's don't agree with that. Mm.